All right. Oh, let me clear that out of the, let me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're recording. <laughs> okay. So thanks again for um, interviewing today about your experience with XR. And because we're recording, could you first share your name, where you're from, and what you do for a living? Sure. Um, well, my name is Jesse Anderson, and uh, I'm currently living in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota right now. And by day, I work as an assistive technology specialist with state services for the blind here in Minnesota. And I work with mostly transition age students. So high school, early college, and, you know, looking at what type of technology, um, technology devices, hardware, software, um, training, what kind of stuff, what type of technology they would need um, to be successful in uh, life after high school. So if they go on to college, if they're looking at employment, uh, that kind of a thing. So that's what I do on my day job. Outside of that, I do also a lot of work in technology and game accessibility. So um, for the past uh, over 12, almost 13 years now, or, or almost 10, or a little over 10 years, I'm sorry, a um, little over 10 years ago now, um, started the Illegally Cited YouTube channel, uh, where I kind of focus on technology accessibility, game accessibility from, you know, like a low vision perspective, try to cover mainstream games, audio games, voiceover accessible games, that kind of a thing. But also working um, over the past several years, I've also worked with... Um, like indie 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 game developers, uh, a couple AAA developers. Uh, I've done some work with Microsoft, um, part of their Low Vision Advisory Board, um, looking at low vision um, tools that Microsoft adds to a lot of their products, like you know the Windows magnifier and all of your color themes and mouse pointer enhancements, those types of things in Windows. So it's a cool thing to be a part of that um and yeah and then just a couple of speaking engagements here and there like at the game accessibility conference i've uh i've been on two panels there and done some other presentations for um i've done some presentations on game accessibility and vr accessibility and uh, all of those are out online somewhere most of them are on my channel so keeping busy, plenty busy. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It sounds like you have a wide range of um, experiences. And I'm wondering, uh, can you talk a little bit more about your YouTube channel and what we might find there? Sure. Um, like I said, I started the YouTube channel in 2012. So yeah, it's, it just hit my 10 year anniversary uh, last year. And it's just surprising that it's been going on for so long. Um, but like I said, basically, um, it's mostly gaming focused, but it's technology and gaming focused. So a lot of what I do is I look at um, mainstream games, you know, mostly PC, but I've been able to also cover some game console titles, um, a lot of mobile stuff, especially iOS. So taking a look at, you know, what game, what kind of games can I play? visually still um, being legally blind. Um, so taking a look at those, um, giving recommendations on how they could make it a game more accessible if they wanted to make it more low vision friendly or even ex uh, even more accessible to totally blind players. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, we got PC, console, iOS, some hardware reviews. So if I get a new gadget, I get a new toy. Um, you know, I just got my new gaming PC updated. Uh, got that built and uh, did so. I kind of did a little review review for that. The headset that I'm using here. Um, you know, doing review for that. Um, if you know something like the Apple Watch or if I get something, you know, just new gadgets or whatever. Um, I also try to do sometimes like i said specific videos uh on games that have really emphasized accessibility over the last couple of years 
Um, so games that are really advertising, hey, we put a lot of accessibility features in our game. Um, like The Last of Us Part 1 and 2, God of War, As Dusk Falls, um, even their most recent uh, Hogwarts Legacy game. Uh, surprisingly, they put a lot of accessibility in there. So, you know, kind of highlighting those titles. Um, and one thing that's... <laughs> It's great, but um, it, it can also be a little bit frustrating um, because there a lot of games, indie games and AAA titles are adding a lot of accessibility features, which is awesome. Um, but I think just because of what I think has to be put into a game to make it playable for someone with no usable vision or very little to no usable vision. Um, there are games, let's say, that'll have text-to-speech, they'll have other features, um, but they they don't necessarily have all of the features like navigation assists to be able to navigate through the world independently if you can't at least somewhat see the game. So um, you know, one of the one of the trends or one of the things now is that you know, it's great that these games are adding more accessibility, um, but especially in like the blindness area, um, people are, <laughs> you know, are kind of understandably a little bit frustrated just because, you know, it's like, oh, they're, they're so close. They have these accessibility features, but they're just not quite there yet, um, especially for something like Hogwarts Legacy, where, you know, people grew up with that universe and like they, they really realized um, you know, the castle, the universe, the, the, you know, everything about it. Um, and they even have a blind character in the game. Um, but it is not fully playable to blind players just yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so like I said, but, you know, even with those drawbacks, you look at even three, four five years ago, you were lucky to have any low vision features or let alone very few accessibility features. If you're lucky, maybe you had subtitles, maybe you had a little bit of control remapping and that's about it. But now you look at, you know, like I said, indie games all the way up to your big budget um, AAA titles, they're adding a lot more accessibility, which is awesome. So two, three years from now, even I, I can't even begin to, guess what will happen. Cool. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that, I think, a little bit more as we dig mm -hmm. in here. Um, it sounds like it certainly keeps you busy with your YouTube channel and other work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, right now, to kind of just take a step back, um, if you're comfortable doing so, because we um, likely have a blind audience, could you describe yourself for those listeners? Um, I guess I've never really thought about it or never really had to never just thought about describing myself, but, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm a middle-aged white guy with brown hair and, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm wearing a Cobra Kai t-shirt cause that show is awesome. Uh, black Cobra Kai t-shirt. Um, and I don't know, you can add, feel free to add whatever else, but. <laughs> oh, that is helpful. Thank you. Um, and if you could also give us a little context about your disability and, and what kind of the day-to-day -day and living with that disability might look like. Sure. So, yeah, I have been legally blind since birth. Um, thankfully, my vision has been stable all my life, it really hasn't changed. Um, glasses don't help. We tried that in grade school, um, didn't really help. So I haven't wore glasses in many, many years. Um, I can't remember exactly what the name of my vision impairment is. It's not really something super common, um, but as part of it, you do have the nystagmus, the rapid eye movement. Um, functionally, I mean, I can see well enough to do a lot of things visually, you know, I can walk around, I can get around fairly well. 
Um, there are times where, where I will use a white cane um, if it's like a really busy or crowded or new environment. Um, but there's a lot of times where I don't necessarily need a cane. Um, as far as like reading, I cannot really read small print. It has to be pretty large, um, have trouble. I really don't, I try not to read anything in like a strange font or handwritten cursive. I really hate reading that because it's very difficult. Um, so when using technology or a computer, I will use either magnification or a screen reader, or I will use a combination of both. For longer term reading, I will definitely go for speech every time because it's just much faster, much easier, much more efficient. Um, and it's just much easier on my eyes. So that's even, you know, kind of tying it back into game accessibility as a few games recently have added more text to speech. Um, yes, it helps people who are totally blind, but it's also awesome because it can really help, um, you know, people like myself with, uh, low vision. I, I, I kind of, when I've done talks before, I've said, you know, having the text to speech there makes it so that I don't have to worry about having to read the interfaces, all the user interface, the UI, the menus, all that stuff. And I can actually save my vision for uh, actually playing the game. So that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, I use Windows Magnifier on my computer. I use um, NVDA a lot of the time for a screen reader, um, voiceover for iOS, and uh, even the I take advantage of the screen readers that are on modern game consoles like the Xbox series and play, uh, PlayStation 5. Got it. Thank you. Yep. All right, cool. So let's let's keep digging in here. Um, and I think you've kind of touched on this a little bit um, with some of your experiences and gaming and things like that. Um, but I'm wondering if we could talk about kind of XR a little bit more broadly, mm -hmm. your experience with it, um, sort of like what it's like for you to use XR, um, and some some sub questions that you might think about as we kind of talk through this um, is what did you know about XR before using it? Why did you choose to use it? Um, and kind of where did you find those experiences of XR, like at home sure. in a public space, et cetera? Yep. Yeah, so I've been interested in I've been interested in XR for. A long, long time. Um, I most of my experiences in it is with virtual reality more so than augmented reality. Um, but I actually got my first VR experience, believe it or not, in 1995. Uh, I was doing. Um, I was part of a group out at the University of Washington uh, called the do it program. And we were out there doing some stuff on the university of Wa university of Washington campus. And one night we got to see an early virtual reality lab. Um, and they had this ginormous, I mean, it was huge. It was like this ginormous headset prototype that was like mounted to the ceiling. Um, because it was just like, you, you could not wear that on your head. It was just ginormous, but uh, I still remember like there was a demo where you held something in your hand and it had like a little tracker or a little sensor on it. And so you were actually like moving a plate in like a kitchen environment. So like when I would put it on the counter, you would see it moving to the counter um, and you would just be looking around this uh, this blue kitchen area. And then they had one where you were floating underwater and you were kind of trying to net fish. There was another one where uh, you were flying through an atom. And so you had like, you know, the protons and electrons, and it was just this kind of weird, surreal uh, experience. So I was really fascinated with, you know, and then just the buzz that we had for VR in the 90s, you know, the lawnmower man and all these other weird things that were happening. But then um, I really caught back up with VR in, well, right before the Oculus Rift came out. And I want to say that was like 2016 or so. 
And I was, like I said, I was really interested in it. And I, I was pretty sure I was going to pick one up because I wanted to explore the technology. You know, I was just fascinated with it from a general perspective. But by then I was, you know, a few years into my YouTube channel. And I thought, well, you know, especially with the high cost of entry back then, because um, you had to have a really beefy uh, PC to run it. Um, and then you had to buy the headset and everything uh, itself. There weren't going to be a lot of people with disabilities, uh, maybe blind or low vision, who would be covering that kind of stuff. And, you know, everyone was and still is kind of talking about, like, how do we make VR work? How do we how do we make virtual reality attractive for people like one of the problems is, um that that it, that people face when trying to use virtual reality is you have to have uh, a big enough play space uh, how do you not make people motion sick um and so uh, how do you do and you know, or, or, uh, how do you do a user interface in a virtual environment? Do you just replicate flat screen menus? Do you kind of do something more gimmicky in 3D? And I thought, well, as people are really starting to try to figure this out, I would bet you money that they're not really going to be thinking much about accessibility because that's always the last thing to be, oh, maybe we should maybe think about that after everything else is done. So I thought, well, if I can at least get my two cents in and be part of the conversation and try to, you know, if people are trying to make standards uh, for what works and what doesn't in VR, could I possibly, you know, get my voice in there so that we don't have to wait and so that, you know, blind or visually impaired users wouldn't be left behind again. I did get a look at uh, the Oculus Rift prototype a friend of mine at a nearby college had a prototype and I was able to go down and see it one morning and it was fascinating because one of the early things that I was wondering about was, so there has been other VR type headsets specifically designed for low vision in the past. Uh, people may have heard of products like the Jordi um, there's a couple other ones that I can't think of the name of right off the top of my head, but these are devices that are specifically designed by assistive technology companies for people who are low vision. And they're neat in concept, but the problem that I always had with them and that I never really understood was the way that when they, when they designed them, you would put the headset on and the image was when you were looking through the device, think about like holding a roll of toilet paper up to your eye where you have to look through the toilet paper roll before you get to the image or you're looking through a binocular. You're looking through the device first. Um, and that was just enough distance to where it made things very hard to read. It was a very small field of view. And one of my early concerns for virtual reality, because they say, oh, yeah, we're going to we want to make it immersive. We want to make it whatever. Was VR going to have that same problem? And thankfully, no, it didn't. Um, I mean, the whole point of VR is to be immersive. So it's right up close to your eye. Um, so that part was really great. And it was way better than, you know, what I had seen for these low vision headsets. There are other problems that I immediately found. Um, the one being one of the early things that early VR headsets didn't always do. You had some headsets that had what they call three degrees of tracking and then six degrees of tracking, which means some headsets you could look around any direction and that's it. It was kind of immersive, but eh, only so much. But the six degrees of tracking meant that you can look around, but then you can also move around. So you can move forward or backward, side to side. And as a low vision user, that is something that really became crucial 
in order to especially be able to see things in the environments or to use an interface. Because just like in real life, if I need to see something, I might get closer to it. And so being able to just lean in, move forward and get closer to something um, was really helpful. But what I found was even though the technology could do that, a lot of apps, a lot of games would purposely set a fixed distance for their UI. So, you know, if they said, well, we think that an average person, we think this should be three feet away from you and that's where it's going to be. So if you try to move forward, it moves that image away from you to maintain that distance. If I lean back, it comes back toward me. So you couldn't get any closer. You couldn't get any um, further away from it. Uh, and that's in a lot of cases, like navigating an environment usually isn't so bad for me in VR, but where I stumble and have the most trouble is menus, user interface, you know, dialogue boxes, setting screens, anything where, you know, I have to adjust things or choose something from a menu or, you know, a settings. Um, because unfortunately, right now, none of the current VR headsets really have any form of accessibility features of much of any kind in them at all except I haven't gotten to play with one yet, um, but I, I do hear that the PlayStation VR 2 that just came out literally a week or two ago, um, I've heard from somebody that it does support the screen reader for their in-headset dashboard because the PlayStation 5 also has a screen reader built into it, so it kind of uses that. I haven't, I haven't been able to verify this for myself or how well it works, but that's the only thing that I know of that has any form of accessibility at this time. Excuse me. Um, oh, one other thing I could add is what's really interesting about virtual reality is, you know, on a flat screen game, I really love first person titles. I especially, I really love first person shooters. And I've tried a few of them in virtual reality and they are cool. Um, they are really neat. They're definitely more immersive, but one, th but I find that one of my favorite genres, you know, the first person shooter in VR is actually very difficult for me to play because on a flat screen, you know, they help you aim by giving you a crosshair or some sort of, you know, aiming reticle, a dot, a crosshair, a circle, whatever in the middle of your screen to know where you're aiming. Uh, in VR, they're like, oh, well, you can just hold up, you know, with your motion controllers, you can hold up your virtual gun and aim down the sights. Well, no, I can't. <laughs> Not really well. Um, so unfortunately, one of my favorite genres, uh, especially I've seen, uh, the PlayStation just announced a lot of, uh, first person shooter titles for their PSVR two uh, during their last keynote or their last little state of play event, uh, last week. And as much as I'd like to play some of those, unless they add some sort of, you know, aiming crosshair that you could turn on. Um, a large type of the, a, lar a large part of those is going to be pretty inaccessible um, to me. But when VR works, it's amazing. Um, the sense of presence, the sense of scale, of immersion, uh, and it doesn't even have to be realistic. You know, one of my favorite VR titles so far is Job Simulator. It's this little cartoony kind of a parody simulator of like, hey, robots in the future, What they, this is what they thought humans would do. This is what they thought humans did for jobs. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it horribly wrong. And it's funny, uh, but it's, it's a great little game. Those are some of my experiences with virtual reality. 
augmented reality, I haven't done as much with that. You know, I do use apps like Seeing AI um, that are very helpful. Um, you know, Seeing AI and Vision AI, things that um, help blind and low vision users, like, you know, recognizing text or, um, you know, I've played with the world features where you can recognize things in your environment or recognize kind of what's in a space. I've tried things like Pokemon Go, but, you know, the app itself is not very accessible. It's not voiceover accessible at all. So I really haven't done much with it and I'm just not really a Pokemon fan. So, you know, really haven't done much with that, but I'm very intrigued about augmented reality and I'm kind of waiting for, you know, they have the Envision glasses out there right now, which kind of put that functionality that I just talked about, being able to recognize text or products or items or whatever, instead of holding your phone wearing like a pair of glasses. I love that idea, but I'm personally sort of waiting for more of an open platform for that to happen. Like, you know, I can buy an iPhone or an Android phone and it's got a camera on it. I can download any app that supports the camera and use it. Um, but right now they have mainly these glasses that are tied to a specific app or two. So you're paying, you know, a couple thousand dollars for one or two apps. But maybe if Apple or Google comes out with something, you know, more mainstream where I can take any old camera app that I want and wear with those glasses, um, that's when I think I would be a little bit more excited about jumping into AR. Yeah, so this is really uh, helpful so far and really interesting to hear your perspective. Um, I want to move into kind of building on those threads of what you hope for um, like VR augmented reality. Um, before I do that, are there mm -hmm. any other um, XR things that you haven't mentioned yet that you might want to um, talk about in this interview today? Um, not really a whole, I mean, I could talk about this pretty much all day. So I'm, tr I'm trying to keep things as brief as I can. Um, but I did do a presentation for in, uh, Inclusive Design 24 way back in 2017. Um, it is on their YouTube channel as well as mine. Um, and I did this presentation on VR accessibility for blind and low vision users. And 95% of it or more is still, I think, just as relevant today, because like I said, unfortunately, um, except for some progress with PlayStation VR 2, um, there really hasn't been any forward momentum, any forward movement in consumer available accessibility for virtual reality now there's been tons of work done like in like behind the scenes and then in, in the research labs um but really nothing there there really hasn't been much in the way of like a product that you and i could go buy for accessibility so really that's where one of the things i'm most hoping for is just for some platform um you know, Oculus is probably, or I suppose we should call them Meta now. Um, they're going to be coming out, I'm sure, with a new headset within the next year or two. Um, you know, we just had PlayStation come out with one. I don't know what other headsets are going to be coming out. Um, but will these include any accessibility? Uh, one example that I really like to um, showcase is... And, and I've told this story a few different places when I got my Oculus Quest. Literally the first thing that they had you do when you take it out of the box, I couldn't do. I had to have sighted assistance. Like I knew exactly what I was supposed to do, but I just couldn't do it. So when you take the headset out of the box, you have to pair the headset with your phone and, and, the, and then the Oculus app that they were using at the time. And I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. I had the app ready. I had the 
you know, I was signed into my Oculus account and everything. And all you had to do was they they had you look at, turn on the headset. They had you um, look in the headset and it would give you a number. Um, like, I don't know if it was like a four digit number, six digit number, whatever. You would read that number, put it in your phone, in, in the app, and then boom, they were paired. But because the numbers in the headset were so small and they were far away, I was not able to read them. You know, they didn't have like a separate card that would give you a number to put in or something like that. So luckily, uh, across the hall, I, I sort of knew that the neighbor across the hall I knocked on her door and I was like, uh, this might sound weird, but can you put this headset on and read me the number? Um, and then once I was able to put the number in, I was, I got, you know, I was fairly okay. Um, but literally the first, you know, the first thing during the setup process, um, I was unable to do independently. So that's, I said, that's about mainly what I can think of. Okay. For now. And, and that's a really helpful story just to think about, like you said, just it coming out of the box. And the first thing you have to do isn't mm -hmm. ex broadly accessible. Um, so thank you for sharing that experience. Yeah. And, and like I said, it, it wasn't that I didn't know what to do. Right. Um, I just physically couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with the things that you've shared in, in mind, and you've touched on, you know, kind of um, what you are hoping for in the future when it comes to um, XR platforms. Mm -hmm. Are there other things um, that you want to share in terms of your vision for XR? Like if you had a magic wand, um, sure. what would you change or, or make happen? Um, how would you like to experience XR in the future? Yeah. So if I had a, yeah, boy, if I had a magic wand and could just kind of make more accessibility happen in, in the near future for XR, there are a few things that immediately come to mind that are, that are difficulties um, for me with low vision, but also that I know would be absolutely necessary uh, for somebody with uh, no usable vision whatsoever. So somebody is totally blind. Um, first, I think you know, even with, like I said, flat screen games adopting this more recently, having text to speech or menu narration throughout the dashboard interface, you know, throughout the, when I put on a headset, um, whether it's connected to my PC or whether it's standalone headset, like the one of the Oculus Quests, um, when I put it on, like the, the largely the VR user interface, the VR home or dashboards are not accessible to me at all. The only real prayer that I've been having so far is that I've been able to largely like launch apps and search for and buy apps or games on my computer or via my iPhone. And then, you know, say, hey, yeah, open that app, start that app on my headset, and then go into the app and hope for the best there. Um, because even if, let's say, you know, if a developer makes their game accessible, let's say, they make a really nice experience that is uh, blind and low vision accessible. That's wonderful. But if I, as a user, can't even really get to this, you know, configure my headset and go to the device's store to search for and buy or download that title, then, yeah, you know, it doesn't really do me a lot of good because I can't even get to the accessible app. Um, so really having accessibility on a platform-wide basis, you know, like how you have a screen reader on your Xbox or your PlayStation 5, um, also having some sort of traditional control scheme, like being able to use like the analog stick on a motion controller or a regular game controller or keyboard and mouse with your headset. So, you know, again, if, if I was totally blind, a lot of the, 
interfaces use kind of like a laser pointer style interface where you're literally pointing a laser or pointing a cursor <clears throat> at an item. And that's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for a blind user to be able to, you know, they don't know the location, they don't know the layout of a particular screen. So being able to sequentially navigate through an interface with the D-pad or an analog stick or some sort of means to A, know what all controls are there, and B, to be able to navigate through them uh, is also going to be important. Um, and e even just having something, like, there's been a couple of apps where they wanted you to enter in something on a virtual keyboard. And sometimes they're far enough away where, again, I'm using this laser pointer interface. I can't really accurately, you know, see to hit the right keys to type in my email address or a password or a, a name if I'm naming my character or something. So being able to just like either have my computer keyboard or having a Bluetooth keyboard, um, because, you know, whether you are fully sighted or not, we're supposed to be able to type without looking at the keyboard anyway. So if I could just walk, you know, up to my keyboard and go, t you know, just use my regular keyboard, um, that would be really helpful. Um, but just having information presented, you know, audibly, tactily, having different control methods, um, but really having that platform wide accessibility, having a full screen magnifier that you could turn on at any time, like Windows magnifier that's built into Windows or even the Mac or iOS or Android has magnifiers built in. There's an app that was unfortunately only in development in the research lab for a little while through Microsoft and it was called Seeing VR. And it was, a member I mentioned Seeing AI earlier for the phones. Seeing VR was kind of a similar concept. It was a suite of accessibility tools that was working with some Unity apps. And it would add things like high contrast themes. It would add a magnifier. It added text-to-speech. It added a thing where if I was pointing at something with a laser pointer, it would read me what I was pointing at. I saw that and when I saw that demonstration, it was like a seven minute video. And I'm just like, man, if they would add this type of suite into um, a, like a VR platform, like I want that yesterday. And it's you now that was a couple of years ago. Uh, and that's and it's nothing like that is still available. And I would love to see that. I did, I kind of did my own little commentary video. Like I, I after I saw that, I'm like, I got to do a video on this. So I watched their video on it and I would pause and comment on like how I would expand that. Um, so I do have, I forgot to mention earlier on that I do have VR content on my, on my channel as well. There are playlists for apps and games and VR accessibility. So yeah, there's a lot of work that has to be done, I think. Um, and I am a part of XR Access as well. I learned about them right at the beginning of the pandemic. And they are a group that is working on making augmented and virtual reality uh, more accessible. And they've been a great group to work with. And i um, interested to see what we can do in that, in that organization. Yeah, absolutely. Before we, I mean, this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. And lots to think about and look forward to. And I'm glad that you're kind of sharing your your own perspective and voice both here and um, in other spaces like your YouTube channel. Um, is there anything else we haven't talked to today that you thought we might talk about that you, you want to make sure um, listeners and viewers know before we sign off here today? Um, nothing really without going like super nerdy and technical. Um, but I, I mean, I think really we are, you know, people with disabilities in general are interested in VR, AR, um, in XR 
we are interested in participating in that type of technology, uh, just like everybody else is. And, um, you know, people are out there, people are willing to, if, you know, if you're a company trying to make your platform or your game or your app accessible, um, you know, there are plenty of people out there who would be able and willing to um, help you make that happen. Um, you know, of course, treating accessibility just like any other core feature of your app uh, is also crucial. So, you know, basically, if you're, you know, if you're hiring someone with a disability um, for consulting or for um, whatever part of the process you're working on, development or research or, like I said, consulting, um, you know, being able to compensate them just like you would any for any other part of your development. Um, and if you don't get it, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're making an app and it doesn't, you know, you don't know that you're going to be able to make it 100%, that's fine. I mean, we would rather have 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 a team give it a try and at least you know there are some accessibility features and that will help some people i mean yes for some you know for some users it's going to be disappointing because it won't work for them you know but like i've seen in the last couple of years like there's been companies who their first title that where they really put in some accessibility features you know it was okay but it was maybe a little bit rough uh, and now we're starting to get to their next game or something, and they've added a lot more. And even some companies that have done, you know, th this is their first real attempt at adding a good level of accessibility. And yeah, there are some shortcomings in a few areas, but I was, like I said, I kind of came back to the most recent example of Hogwarts Legacy being, I was genuinely impressed add a lot of the accessibility features they, that they put in. Would there be a couple things I would love for them to add? Yeah, sure. Um, but because of what they did add, um, that made the game largely very playable for me. So, you know, it's even if it's not perfect, do what you can. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you so much. I will stop recording here.